we're in the midst of a huge transformation where our peers, communities, and workplaces are all really melding into one. Welcome to Reimagining Company Culture. My name is Christina Giuliano, and I'm a Partnerships Manager here at All Voices, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Today, I am especially excited to welcome our next guest to the show, Brandon Bell. He is the North America Diversity and Inclusion Lead at Syngenta, and he's also participated in um, one of our webinars before, so we are not strangers. Brandon, how are you doing? I'm pretty good, Christina. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm excited for our conversation. If you want to start off by telling uh, the folks listening a little bit more about yourself, including your pronouns, and what do you like to do outside of work? Yeah, sure. Um, so hello, folks. My name is Brandon Bell. My pronouns are he, him, his. Um, as Christina mentioned, I serve as the DNI lead for Syngenta North America. And when I'm not at work, I enjoy gardening. As you can see, a slew of plants Beautiful. behind me. Thank you. Um, and I'm also a big fan of creating and making music as well. So I try to like write songs, sing a couple songs on the weekend as well. Do you upload your songs to SoundCloud or any streaming services? <laughs> no, I'm not good enough for that, but it's a good <laughs> creative outlet for me. So yeah, I just keep, typically keep it, um, you know, for me and my close friends. No, I love that. I think it's important to have a creative outlet, especially in the work that you are doing as well, which is something I definitely wanted to to start the conversation off too, is asking what has really led you to designing inclusive and equitable systems um, and also led you to your uh, journey at Syngenta. Yeah, um, good question. You know, I, I, you know, I kind of have a different pathway, if that's okay, if you don't mind me telling my story. Yes, so please. when I, when I finished undergrad, I actually started off, my first role was as a crisis counselor. Mm -hmm. um, on the coast of North Carolina. And as a crisis counselor working with women, children, um, folks who find themselves in less than ideal circumstances, it was in learning how to support them and really leaning into the supports that might exist in a community to continue to support them. But I recognize that like individual interventions are great, but what we really wanna focus on is systemic changes that change the environment that individuals even find themselves in, if that makes any sense. So as a, as a crisis counselor, I was thinking like, okay, well, there's things that I can do in the moment, but while I'm working with that individual, can I also keep an eye on systems, right? And can I really think about influencing the ways in which systems create environments that lessen the risk of them being in that precarious situation to begin with? Sure. So that's kind of when I started thinking about systems and equity. And, and in a lot of ways, equity and justice are aligned. But when I started my role, you know, I don't know, 10 years ago, it was really more about saying like, wow, these situations are less than ideal, right? And what can I do on an individual and macro level to kind of make sure folks don't have similar um, experiences in the future. Um, so after my job as a crisis counselor, I got into higher education where I spent the bulk of my career. Um, so seven years working with students of color, but also working with faculty staff, students who might hold majority identities to really start the conversation and be a catalyst to dialogue and really shifting the conversation from equity to inequity, diversity and inclusion from debate to really like constructive like conversation where we can really find ways to partner, synergize identify shared needs, identify our roles in creating more inclusive cultures, and then really galvanizing our, our talent, skills, and resources to get to that shared end goal. Um, so most recently, that's led me to Syngenta, where you know, I have an opportunity to work um, in the North America region, supporting our colleagues in the US and Canada, and very sim similarly serving as a broker to understanding across what seems to be like different groups, right? And really helping people drop connections and saying like, hey, do our differences actually have to be impediments to our organization or are our differences actually an opportunity to do the work that we're trying to do even better? Can we leverage our differences to better synergize, to better collaborate, to serve our end users? And I guess, laddering up to the last part of your question, all of that is at the intersection of individual needs and systemic outcomes, right? So I really see myself in the middle and like being a catalyst to those things, being a, being a driver in some ways, but also being an enabler, right? So letting the natural creative awesome organic things that people produce really shine and finding ways to better connect folks to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that conversation, I was talking to someone about this the other day too, of individual action versus collective action and just, you know, what makes the most sense in terms of having impact. And it's great to have like an impact on an individual level, but we also need systemic change in order to get the ball rocking and rolling. So I love, I love that um, kind of you know, description there and also your personal journey. Doing this work, a decade in this work is not uh, nothing to shy away from as well. So 
definitely want to acknowledge that too. Um, you mentioned your role as kind of like a broker at Syngenta. Um, we're seeing a lot of roles pop up in diversity, equity, and inclusion for our program managers, for chief diversity officers to across the board. Um, can you dig in a little bit deeper to what it really means to be the North America DNI lead um, at the organization and just kind of, you know, maybe some of the projects or just like what you're really goals are um, for the organization? Yeah, I think for me at the core, it's really about leveraging equity, diversity, and inclusion is just one more way to really maximize like the potential we have in the organization. So at the core, I think my job is to really help people tap into um, the power of people, right? And, you know, diversity and inclusion, what, a, what better way, what better um, forum to do that, right? But it manifests in a couple of ways. So it might show up in traditional L&D opportunities where, you know, most recently we're having a conversation around LGBTQI plus identities. And what does it really mean to create a safe space? Um, it might also manifest in like some coaching, right, where I have a chance to talk to an employee, talk to a leader, and, and really encourage the leader to tap into their lived experience to really be a compass in what we're trying to do, right, and maybe helping them understand how their lived experiences already position them to be really strong advocates in the space. And again, enabling those natural dispositions those natural talents to really help them drive business cases, right? To drive the business cause for equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, you know, sometimes it shows up as well as, you know, smaller projects where maybe I'm just working with an ERG who's looking to make a new logo yeah. or working with an ERG who's really excited about revamping their strategic plan um, to better serve not only the folks that their affinity group is really connected to, but for our allies in the, our organization who might not know the best way to connect or show up and support. So in all of those ways, I really see the core of my work being like a thought partner, um, yeah. but also being like a tactical person on the ground to help bring those awesome thoughts to life. And again, really making sure that at the core, I'm driving all of the individuals in our organization to respect and see the power that we have as a collective community. Absolutely. And what I hear from that as well is it's not just like DNI is something that is separate from your organization. You're involved with employee resource group leaders. You're involved in leadership um, managers, which is really important right now. I um, mean, just all functions of the business, because I think what we're talking about, too, is not siloing out DNI as just a check the box. This is something that we're doing, but it's really embedded in processes as well. Um, digging specifically into kind of the works and agendas in and, you know, talking about environmental and social justice, some folks who aren't in the work are just like seeing this in, in the news are saying, okay, like this, these are separate um, kind of topics for discussion, but they are interconnected. Can you tell us your thoughts about how they are um, kind of connected? Yeah, and that's a really good question. It's a question that I've been getting um, a lot recently. <laughs> so I like to, I like to frame it um, as the three P's people, planet, and prosperity, right? Um, and at the core, you know, agriculture, you know, business, um, you and I, we all share the planet, right? So that's like our shared, like, shared kind of goal. And we want to make sure that the planet is an inclusive space where we have the ability to not only, you know, respect the land and, and, and navigate the land, but also make sure that, you know, it actually provides safe space for all folks, right? So people and planet. Um, prosperity is where it kind of turns into like the, the crux for me, where we say, what does prosperity actually mean? And for some people, it's more about like, you know, the, the funds we get at the end of the year, or it's about um, the access that I particularly have to a certain set of resources. And I like to reframe it and to say like, as individuals sharing a planet, what's our opportunity to make sure that all of us have the ability to tap into a common wealth, if you will, or what's our ability or what's our responsibility to make sure as individuals sharing the planet that everyone has the ability to tap into like shared resources. That prosperity isn't something limited to a certain sect of people, but in us building a community, sharing a space, what does it actually look like to make sure that all the needs across all the different groups are actually met? So I like to tell people that environmental um, justice, agriculture, equity, diversity, inclusion is inherently tied for the simple fact that we share this space and we wanna make sure that we're maximizing what the space can offer but there aren't disparities in who can tap into the resources present. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I think that definitely makes sense to me. And I think framing it in the three P's is definitely helpful for folks to remember as well. Shifting to more of like a setting of the workplace and corporate America and like along those same lines of creating space, creating a more equitable workplace and system. Um, where are you seeing kind of the future of work changing in that like companies are actually making a like concerted effort to create this environment um what like kind of advice do you have for them if they're actually committed to doing the work with a capital w 
Yeah, well, there's a couple of things. Um, I think really making sure that we continue to tie equity, diversity, and inclusion to the business is important. And even as I say that, I want to, I maybe even want to reword that, um, continuing to remind people of the value that equity, diversity, and inclusion brings to the business. I think for a long time, we've known that, you know, diverse teams make decisions quicker. Sometimes diverse teams make decisions that actually help people grow market share. Um, oftentimes, you know, just having a more collaborative and inclusive environment impacts employee engagement for the better. Um, it impacts employee morale for the better. So I would say like, even as we're making the shift to hybrid work, even as people are responding to questions of um, inequity, um, particularly at this moment, racial inequity, gender inequity, inequity for LGBTQ folks in particular, um, that we continue to remind people that while the work may be hard, it has incredible dividends, both tangible and the bottom line, but also, you know, personal, dare I say, spiritually, right? Um, just to touch a little bit on uh, the future of work and what that means is that let's keep in mind that, you know, um, work has always been, you know, um, something that takes a lot of people's time, right? So, <laughs> and now that we're in the hybrid space, um, bringing work home, like bringing work to my apartment, right? Um, this has different implications as to how I understand work, how I understand myself, what boundaries look like. So I think it's going to be incredibly important that while we shift to the hybrid model, and which in many ways could, you know, provide a lot of opportunities to industry, that we don't forget that or don't allow hybrid work to come at the expense of people's holistic well-being, mental well-being, physical well-being, and spiritual well-being. So I don't necessarily have any pro tips for the hybrid work piece because I'm embarking on it with you and, and all of my yeah. other colleagues who might see this, but I definitely have a watch out to say, let's not, let's not center hybrid work at the expense of the things that we really cherish that in our humanity, right? And that holistic wellness piece will be. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a huge conversation that's happening right now too, in terms of the whole person, the whole employee and mental health um, is definitely something that uh, we've been like, thinking about how to support employees and meeting where they are, since that means different things for different different folks too. Um, the other piece of just like supporting employees and creating that equitable environment is, which is different too, is celebration and celebration of identities at organizations. And oftentimes they do that through heritage celebrations or monthly celebrations, Women's History Month. We are in June, so we have a huge corporate celebration of pride that we're seeing um, across the board on LinkedIn. Um, we also have Juneteenth that's coming up as well. Um, I would love to ask and kind of what you're seeing, how are you thinking about organizations really authentically engaging in these celebrations? That's not so, I feel like it's an overused word, but performative or checking the box or something like, uh, like that. Yeah, good question. Um, I think there's value. I think it's, I want to give you a both and answer, right? Okay. <laughs> or a that and answer. Yeah. Um, I think it's great for organizations to to take the different heritage months and observances as a way to kind of like celebrate um, diversity, hopefully continue to advance inclusive cultures, but probably most importantly, broker equity, right? So I would tell any any of my colleagues, any business leader in any industry that like, hey, it's it's never ha hard or harmful you know, to, to write a post, share a memo with the organization, um, change a logo, um, to let people know that you are visibly and actively recognizing the value that differences bring to an organization. So that's kind of the that. And I would like to add my and and say, but probably what really shows that the rubber has met the road, what really shows that an organization is, you know, talking the talk and walking the walk is what it looks like for your outcomes. And it goes back to what I shared earlier about brokering equity, right? So you know, you can do all these grand gestures, you can change your logo a million times over the course of a year. If we continue to see disparity and like employment outcomes, right? If we continue to hear that employees who maybe show up in um, underrepresented capacities in the organization continue to feel incredibly marginalized despite your logo change, despite your memo to the organization, I think we have a problem, right? So it's one thing to celebrate and, and who doesn't like a good celebration, right? But it's more importantly, to recognize that when the celebrations change and shift and evolve over time, that we keep a really focused eye on making sure that equity is being brokered. Um, and at Syngenta, we have a really awesome phrase. It's all about determined execution, one team, one goal, you know, and we all work together in different ways to meet that goal. And I really like that particular value of determined execution as it relates to equity and making sure that we're doing all of the things we can do to make sure we're actually moving the needle as the celebrations over the years happen. Yeah, absolutely. And I think something that folks need to remember as well, too, along the lines of what you were talking about as well, it's, it's not just 
one celebration. It's not just, okay, like we're doing a good job because we're celebrating identity, which is which is great. We want folks to be visible. We want that kind of support from, from leadership as well, but we also want benefits and we want kind of other examples and manifestations that you're supporting uh, folks coming from different identities and underrepresented backgrounds as well. Um, and it's not a kind of a one and done check the box uh, kind of action there. It's continued long lasting. Um, and I feel like in these conversations, a lot of folks are asking, how do we really measure our progress or lack thereof? So um, can you provide just like an example of how you implemented and like measured an effective diversity, equity and inclusion strategy, whether it was at you know, diversity abroad, rising media, like women in agriculture or Syngenta could be across the board in your experience. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, some of the things you just mentioned are good examples of how rubber meets the road. Um, so like, you know, for me, you know, if we're talking about equity, a component of that is access. So like a good example would be when we look at our parental leave benefits, right? Do we call it parental leave, paternity leave or maternity leave, mm -hmm. right? This language changes the language, create access. But more importantly, like, you know, if people are looking to adopt, whether they are, you know, partnered, married, same sex couples, heteronormative couples, that the resources, right, are accessible regardless of the compositional makeup of that relationship or partnership. As one great example of not only measuring success, like, so no, we're not going to necessarily count and say how many same sex partnerships um, adopted kids this year, right? right. <laughs> but we can at least say we've created more access. And regardless of someone's orientation or nature or makeup of their partnership, they have access to the same benefits, resources, opportunities afforded by a company. Um, another great example would be working with employee resource groups and shifting the narrative that employee resource groups are exclusive member only clubs to saying that they are affinity groups who share a shared purpose, who operate at the intersection of business needs. So aligning ERG strategies directly to business priorities year over year Another great example, in the, at least in the equity space for me, of, draw, of you know, removing barriers and connecting individuals to shared opportunity, right? And allowing individuals to see like, sure, we might have differences in our identity, but in the shared space, uh, what ways can we leverage those differences to really move us towards common goals? As those two quick examples. No, absolutely. And I think language is so important and something that a lot of folks are kind of focusing on right now in terms of whether it's gender language where everyone says like, hey, you guys are just, you know, making something um, a little bit less inclusive than it could be and language and words do matter. Um, so I, I definitely love those two examples. And then another piece of that you mentioned, which we talked about uh, pretty much at length as well in the webinar and our previous conversation too is employee resource groups. A lot of companies have either started their ERGs in the last year or they've had them and they're reinvigorating them and they're constantly thinking about goals. And there are a lot of ways you can go with this from community involvement, internal employee engagement programs and events. Um, and there are some misconceptions around what ERGs are. We know LinkedIn just released um, the statement saying they're gonna pay their ERG leaders uh, 10K additional sort of salary, which is amazing. ERG leaders should be compensated. But in your opinion, what are ERGs, like what are the goals and what is like, what are they clearly not? Yeah, um, I guess I'll start with what they're clearly not. Um, they're not member only clubs, but they are safe spaces, right? So sometimes I think there's a there can be some um, confusion as to what that means. So, you know, I'm African-American, you know, have belonged to several black ERGs, black employee resource groups over my professional tenure. Um, and in many ways, there are safe spaces, right? But they're not member only organizations, meaning that there might be time when we might want to have an in-community conversation. But we also really want to bring folks who might not be a member of our particular, particular racial ethnic community into the dialogue for the sake of understanding, building coalitions and building allies, right? So they're absolutely a safe space that might serve in community needs and probably always center community business priorities, recruitment, retention, career advancement. They're not exclusive clubs, right? They work. They should be working with other ERGs across racial, ethnic, gender, orientation lines, really build an inclusive community. Another thing that ERGs are not is that they're not deficits to the business. They are not detractors from business outcomes. In fact, they can be incredible catalysts and boosters to employee engagement and employee morale. And in many ways, they can be strategic advisory partners to many business needs, whether that be marketing, procurement, human resources. ERGs have extensive networks and also have pretty good ideas that we can leverage to support business needs, right? 
So I, I would kind of end my definition as to what ERGs are and are not by just reiterating what they are, right? They're corporately aligned and recognized organizations within, the, within a company or a group that are seeking to advance, you know, needs of an inclusive community at the intersection of making sure the business is most successful moving forward. They are partners with an organization that sometimes might have to challenge an organization, but challenge doesn't necessarily mean that consensus can't be built. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I definitely agree with you. And I definitely think that there are, it's also a partner, a formal partnership too with an organization. So you're not tapping employees and asking them multiple times to be part of a focus group where you're asking for their opinion one off and just not recognizing all of the, the work that they're doing too. Uh, so I think that could also be, be something of note. Um, and I know we're talking a lot about action and it's great to see so many companies, um, especially in kind of tech, take action or try with, with good intention too as well uh, to make their environment more inclusive. Um, I know you wrote kind of an article in February where you talked about inclusivity being an enabler of innovation. You mentioned this at the top of the call as well, where it really provides the support structure to help ensure representation, acknowledgement, engagement, and opportunity for all. And I definitely agree with that. I would say a lot of folks in the DEI space agree with that. Um, but I do want to ask, do you think that we are past the conversation where we need to convince folks that inclusivity is important? Or do you think that is still something we need to discuss? Yeah, um, I don't, I wouldn't use the word convince, I would say, but we always need to keep it top of mind, right? And, and maybe we need to remind people, right, um, that it is important. And I think sometimes, you know, we can get into our groove, get into our rut, maybe unfortunately get into our echo chamber. And we need to be reminded that inclusivity really is important. And like challenging point, our points of view, not for the sake of debate, but for dialogue is incredibly healthy, right? And if we can synergize different points of views to get towards a shared goal, that is really where you see inclusivity create a space of belonging. In theory, it would be, you know, Christina and Brandon can be different and similar at the same time. Mm -hmm. And in action and practicality, it's our differences don't stop us from saying like, hey, if we really care about diversity, equity, and inclusion, how do our differences actually enable us to best elevate that message, to best bring that idea to life, right? So I think people just need to be reminded of that. You know, you and I have different racial and ethnic identities, but a similarity and being racially and ethnically diverse. Mm -hmm. So those are like good examples of like differences don't necessarily have to be uh, a determinant to our relationship, right? We can be incredibly inclusive, honoring the differences and celebrating the differences, leveraging the differences so that we work together towards a common goal. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Did I say that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I that makes sense. I mean, it makes, sense. it makes sense to me. I think it's something that is important to keep top of mind and your point about echo chambers and thinking that, you know, this is a number one priority for everyone. We're seeing a lot of movement towards time, money and resources uh, to DEI as well, but we can't lose focus of kind of a North Star and also uh, just remembering the foundation of, of the work um, is, is super important. Um, I think a lot of the conversation too is around really employee listening, connection and engagement, whether you are virtual or remote first or back in the office for whatever time period in the week. Um, in your opinion, why is it important to really build that trust with employees? And mm. how do you see that like manifesting in the business? Since you also mentioned, it's really important for folks to kind of align their DEI work with the business goals and really be embedded in the process. Yeah, that's a good question and a lot of questions there. So let me know if I missed some of the some of the points there, but there are a couple of things I wanted to share around that. Um, you talked about building trust, and I think that's really important. Um, and as you know, as, as corny as it sounds, it's going to be a two-way street, right? Yeah. It really is. So I'll speak from the vantage point of an organization like Capital O, right? Um, it's about being consistent and it is about actually actioning the great goals that you shared maybe last summer, right? <laughs> or the great goals you shared at the beginning of the year. Like, that's going to be incredibly important and people feeling as though it's not a performative action. Um, and I agree with you, Christina, we use the word performative a lot over the last 18 or so months, but it's the perfect word, right? Yeah. And if you really want to build trust as an organization, again, capital O, like you got to make sure that you're actually showing up and putting up for the great things that you said you would do a year or so ago. Um, conversely, for the employees, right, and I'll say employees, capital E, regardless of your background, right, right, identities you hold, it is also about recognizing that true systemic change and impactful change does not always happen overnight. Um, and very similar to trust, you know, change is not something that is easily established, right, and sometimes it happens in steps and iterations, and we are in it for the long haul. 
a colleague of mine um, often says like that she reminds me and, and I remind her that we are in it for the marathon, not the sprint. And in many ways, think of this marathon as a marathon that's also a relay where it's okay to pass the baton. It's okay to trust that you have a team member that can run the next iteration of that sprint or the next part of this marathon, but you have to do it in collaboration. So that kind of wraps up my, my, my final kind of piece around building trust that we have to enter the space wanting to collaborate. We all play different roles in this, in this marathon, if you will. We all play different roles in this race. We just got to recognize that the race is not against each other. It's a shared race to the finish line, which is equity. So those are like some of my thoughts around building trust. And what was the other question that you had? I just wanted to know how it was um, kind of what, when you build this, when you have that two-way communication, when you have um, just like everyone coming in with collaboration, why is it important to the business? But I think it's a pretty clear answer in terms of trust uh, within an organization. Yeah, and I can I just build on that, Christina? Um, yeah. Just a little bit of nuance. Like, I think as you're, you know, you had talked about collaborating and working together, like having regular touch points to like kind of check in on the progress will be key. Um, these aren't progress reports where like one part of the organization reprimands another. They're actually touch points for people to collaborate and say like, hey, where do we need to pivot? Where do we need to like focus on some quality assurance to make sure that certain part of the plan is actioned or is successful? Um, but those check-ins are a great way to make sure that you're not only talking at each or rather make sure you're not talking at each other, but talking with each other, right? And really conversing and making sure the strategy is still aligned, still appropriate. Um, another way in which that can manifest for me is to like being open enough to recognize that, hey, as a context change, we have to change. Our North Star, as you mentioned, is still equity, but how we get there very well needs to be applicable to the industry, the needs of the employees and the needs of the business. Um, so that's really where that trust shows up. Sometimes people might perceive a pivot to be a sidestep around something important. And I think that's why those touch points really help people align. It can be easy when you're trying to move forward a huge initiative for us to get focused on one part of the initiative and never zoom out and see the whole picture. Um, so, so I think that's really important. Like, And it can be difficult, but you want to be nimble, agile, and you want to be able to take perspective as well. Absolutely. Nimble, agile, dynamic. Nothing is, we can't use the expression, this is the way things always have been. Right. So we have to right. keep doing it this way and just having an open mind about that as well. And I think when you do build that trust, whether it's on a one to one basis with, you know, with a company as well, you're able to give that constructive feedback too and feel like you will be heard, listened to, and seen as an individual um, because the organization will act on kind of your feedback or they will listen to you and let you know what they are doing. Um, in re in response to that, so um, I think yes, that's helpful. I, I love I love what you said about constructive feedback because if I could re if I could have something blown up and posted around my office, it would be constructive feedback is not negative critique. Yes, I would also order a poster that says that too in big bold letters. <laughs> uh, is there something that you're seeing kind of in the industry as we are seeing more folks really put an emphasis on it in the organization, whether it's a trend or just something that's emerging that either you think individuals and organizations need to hone in on in order to be successful in the future? Yeah, I was pondering. Um, I think, I don't, I don't know. Um, it's a, I don't know. It's a trend, but I don't want it. I don't want anyone to misunderstand me as saying it's trendy. Yes. Um, but right. like, like, but like mental well-being is going to be key. It has always been key. But I think, you know, having a pandemic and then like heightened instances, heightened instances of very public injustice towards a variety of groups right. um, has really maybe super magnified the need to make sure that we are taking into consideration people holistic, holistic well-being, right? And I, and I really think moving forward, again, as we talk about equity, as we talk about the future of work, that we cannot let the ball of mental health drop, right? And there's, there's tons of priorities. There are always gonna be a million business priorities regardless of the organization, but your people are really your number one priority. They absolutely are. And I think across industries globally, we're really gonna have to think about how do we drive business success, but also make sure that we're taking really good care of, of the humans who bring the strategy to life every day. So I, I guess that's kind of like the, the thing for me right now that's really resonating and something that I'm seeing a lot on LinkedIn and in other spaces. Um, I'm hopeful that we will translate the, the visibility of the topic of mental health to actual policies and practices sooner rather than later. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think I'm hearing more and more as well. It's not only unlimited PTO, which is helpful for folks just to take time when they need it, but also company-wide days that everybody is not on Slack and you're not worried that someone's going to email you and also modeling that from the top for leadership too. So how they're using the resources that may be available at the company and just reimagining what the difference between benefits and perks are too, and not saying like we have this perk of, you know, you can meditate once a month for 30 minutes. And that is how we're taking care of employees' mental health. I would argue that that's not as helpful as some other things can be. I don't know if you agree. Yeah. And I want to give some examples too, Christina, of like things that I think might actually support mental health. Like, so like you said, it's not just unlimited PTO. It's also how you recognize people's contributions. Yeah. And that can be a thank you, but it can also be like public displays of recognition. Yeah. The recognition for people doing things that might not be the most glamorous or the most visible shouldn't sure. be downplayed in your performance review. And there are tons of things you can do to show people that you care, that promotes their holistic well-being. And, and I think sometimes we lose sight of the fundamentals and the basics. So I absolutely agree. Like you can have a wonderful meditation room. You can have <laughs> really room. awesome. <laughs> What'd you say? A nap room. I feel yeah. like very uh, Silicon Valley-esque. <laughs> Perhaps. You can have all those things though, right? But it doesn't necessarily mean that you got to stray away from the basics. Does that make yes. sense? Yeah, bring it back. Which to is me. like, you know, yeah. Well, when, when I think about like common courtesy, decency, letting people know that you actually appreciate them, being sincere, um, asking the employee how they want to be appreciated are, are things that don't necessarily need a change in policy, but maybe a change in management and leadership. You know, so sometimes sometimes like small tweaks to like individual behaviors can have systemic impact. And I just hope that we we start to have a conversation about those actions. These are things that we can do tomorrow or today with your manager yes. as well. And I think it's important to note too that as a manager or someone who's leading a team, it's not always, or you know, less than 50% of the time, it's not always you having the answers, but having the openness to have a conversation and asking, how do you want to be supported? And really checking in on your team and having that conversation and not just assuming you know what your team needs and wants at a specific time or how they're feeling as well. So I, I really appreciate that question. Oh, well, thanks. And this work is definitely exhausting. It's also exciting. And I can definitely tell that you are passionate about it. But do you have a recent proudest moment where you were in your moment of flow, whether it's big or small, thinking that you were in the exact right place at the right time and you just, you know, felt grateful to be in this space? Yeah, I'm thinking. Um, I don't know. Like, I think I think my, my proudest moment um, most recently has probably been watching people lean into the conversation who might, for whatever reason, haven't leaned into the conversation before. Right. Um, and oftentimes I tell people, um, depending on your past experiences, you might have been oriented to the conversation of equity, diversity, and inclusion through the lens of shame, blame, doom, gloom, and guilt. Yeah. And I, and, and I, and I recognize that those are human emotions, right? And, and shame and guilt sometimes can be positive because if you recognize something is wrong, hopefully that changes behavior. Oh, yeah. But what I like to tell people is like, don't over index on shame or guilt. Let's focus on shared accountability and share responsibility. Um, and, and having people recognize the past, having people recognize that, hey, this doesn't feel good. This isn't what we want it to be. But then leveraging that feeling to say, what can we do together to make sure that never happens? Mm -hmm. By watching people shit, like honor the past, but really like center the present and future has been really rewarding to me, right? And it, and I and I say rewarding, not because I feel as though I'm I'm changing minds and changing hearts, rewarding in that you see people begin to reconsider different perspectives. Like right. it, that is rewarding to see someone to say like, hey, maybe it's okay to change my mind, right? And and that can be liberating in so many levels for, for anybody, right? To just give yourself enough grace and say, hey, I'm gonna try something different. I'm gonna, I'm gonna engage this really hard topic in a different way. I'm gonna bring a new level of agency. Um, and that's what kind of keeps me going. Like, as you mentioned earlier, earlier, it's tiring work. It is tiring work. It's hard work. Um, it's emotionally exhausting. But when you see people say, hey, I'm going to try it a different way, like that gives me new life. It gives me new energy. Absolutely. We're seeing a lot of folks lean into the conversation, which is absolutely amazing. And like you said, I personally also don't think that anyone's guilt is 
helpful for anyone or anyone's shame is helpful for anyone if you just dwell on it and don't and don't do anything and spiral and just to think you know it's only you and you can't make a difference as well I think really acting on it say okay how can I do better what can I do with this shared accountability is really that's actionable and that's that's really powerful in in my opinion as well uh is there anything that I either didn't ask you or a point you want to kind of re-emphasize as a key insight for folks to take away from our conversation um, and how, of course, can people get in touch with you if they have questions or want to comment on all the great things that you're doing? Oh, well, well thanks. Um, uh, I would say, well, I guess start with getting in contact. You can always connect with me on LinkedIn. Feel free. Um, Brandon Bell on LinkedIn. Um, Christina and I are friends. So if you can find Christina, you can find me. Friends. <laughs> yes. And um, I guess you asked really great questions. So I have nothing to add. I just want to remind okay. people marathon, not sprint. Right. And I can and, I, and trust me, I know why we want to sprint to get there. But what I like to tell people, we're, we might be working against thousands of years of ideologies, right, or 400 years of an approach to something. So what we can do every day is make sure that we are eroding away that problematic ideology. But success will manifest in a variety of ways. Take that moment to like, you know, every you know, every so often, take a moment to kind of look back and reflect to see where you've gone. And then you might not be at the finish line, but it doesn't mean you haven't made progress. Right. So, I, so I say that to all the folks who are out here doing the good work, who might have, who have probably been doing the good work much longer than I, um, that they are seen and valued. I want to thank them for creating the space for me and all the other new ED&I folks who are popping up in organizations like I stand on the shoulders of, of giants, quite literally. Um, and I would encourage everyone watching the, the video, right, to, you know, keep their eye on the prize, the ultimate goal. And the ultimate goal is for us to share. Amazing. Keep your eye on the prize, celebrate the small and big wins and keep fighting the good, the good fight. Brandon Bell, thank you so much for being oh. on Reimagining Company Culture. Oh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Absolutely. And for as a reminder for folks who are listening, All Voices believes in the empowerment of everyone to speak up at an organization and thinks it's a requirement in order for folks to succeed. We'll speak soon.